you'll find uh, destinations, uh, Verena and Bellaccio, that are filled with that wonderful sort of uh, patina of uh, 1908 aristocratic travel. That's one reason I like Lago de Como, Lake Como. It feels like uh, the Italy Lucy would have experienced when she ventured all the way from England down to Florence. One great thing, if you're an aristocrat like Lucy or George, is to be able to see art you've always heard of in situ. Art actually put where it was designed, paid for to be 500 years before or whatever. And when you go to Florence especially, you can see a lot of the greatest art in Europe in situ. <laughs> and artists and people who want to be artistic have gone down there and found inspiration ever since. And even today, tourists find themselves uh, admiring local bohemian artists and imagining what it would be like to not be so buttoned down and to be more bohemian and more uh, edgy and more creative. One thing I noticed in uh, the room for the view that's there very clearly today is this energy in the streets. There's a, uh, in Naples, it's called Basso Living, living in the streets. And you see that today in Naples, but when Lucy visited Florence, I'm sure they had the living in the street in Florence as well. As a matter of fact, one time she goes walking in the evening just to get a, a sense of uh, feel the pulse of that city. And uh, one of the great joys of traveling in Italy all through the ages has been to really connect with the local people and get up there and, and, and see how people are living. To pay too much for a cappuccino in a beautiful piece of uh, real estate there and just take all the time in the world to watch the Italian scene go by. Of course, the Italians are out in 1908, just like in 2014, doing the passeggiata, the stroll, the passeo. And it's my favorite part of the day in Italy. In some small towns, they call it the basca, the lap. And people would be taking their laps in the evening. And everybody's out, uh, you know, in, in Lucy's day, tipping their hats and checking out the fashions and this sort of thing. And it happens to this day in your travels. One of the tips that I really think is important, if you do have the opportunity to go to Italy, inspired by a room with a view, is to do sit in a cafe and, uh, you know, get your uh, bricks or your uh, uh, whatever drink you, you feel like would help you fit in and just enjoy the scene. Remember, it's a little pricey, but it's very inexpensive if, if you consider it renting a piece of real estate in the most beautiful sort of ambience you can find in Europe. That's what you're doing, is you're enjoying the parade of life, just like Lucy would have. I was really impressed in a room with a view uh, how, how they had these very formal tent deals and uh, big shots. When I first started traveling, uh, back when I was a kid, there was a little remnant of that still going on where people would move into a, a elegant, traditional, venerable pension. And pension means it comes with dinner. And you'll notice in the play that everybody eats as a little community at the pension and they kind of get to know each other. You got these eccentric characters. And, and that's actually, I think, where Lucy and George first met, was in the pension. To this day, when you go to Florence, you can find pensions that evoke that same sort of era, 1908, and you can imagine what it would be like in the day before fast food and uh, all sorts of modern conveniences and people would just eat for the comfort and the predictability and, and, and the coziness with their uh, fellow pension mates in the dining hall of the place they're staying. When you think of Florence, everything in the play, except the trip out to Fiesole, is within an easy walk of that dome. That dome is the symbol of the Florentine Renaissance, and that's the symbol to me of how Florence took Europe out of the Dark Age into the modern age. So it's the birth of humanism, really, the Renaissance. Uh, Europe was, of course, uh, the, well, the Roman Empire was so high, and you can, you can impress it mostly within the Rome Bell in 500 AD or so. There's like nine or 1,000 years of uh, medieval uh, struggling. And then in Florence, in the year 1400, they came out of it. And there was so much going on in Florence, and three or 400 years later, that's why Lucy and aristocrats like her would make Florence a stop on their route. So they would have a hotel with beautiful views, and right about here would be Santa Croce, and right over there is the Casa della Signoria, where the uh, Santa Croce is a little off the... We're just gonna interrupt in one second because right there, that yellow building, is the building where Ian Forrester's stay, the Pension he stayed in, that, when the, 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 he based the Hotel Bertolini on. Her right there. Hotel Bertolini, right there. I was yeah. wondering about that, David, because I really didn't know where the We tracked it down was. when we were there. It's a private residence now, but it just happens to be in your picture from the yeah. desert, right there. I planned that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take Mark Mark's wife. Actually, I, I, over the days, over the years, I've been taking groups to uh, Florence and so on. We have had different pensions along the Arno, and they are elegant old hotels with breakfast rooms that have 
frescoes on the ceiling where the chandelier comes down and, and the uh, buffets and the tables and the chairs feel just like right out of a room with a view. And, and you can actually have that today, which I just think is, is a lot of fun. But, but that is that. That's a good spot for the room to be, uh, the, the play to be uh, inspired by. Now, when you look at a modern city today, it's easy to forget that in its day, like as a traveler, you're going there to kind of understand what it was like in the old days. It didn't sprawl so much. That's important for us to remember. All over Europe, you can, if you look at a map, you will see there's a circular road going out from the river. That was the medieval wall. And then the city grew beyond that, and the wall was necessary before the country was solidified. Remember, Italy was not Italy until 1870 or something, so they needed a wall. But in modern times, of course, it's congested, a little narrow lane, plus the traffic it grew much wider than that. So what you do is you tear down that wall and you create a circular boulevard. And if you look here, this is before the modern age, and in Florence you've got this circular wall naturally going out from the river. And today the wall is long gone, it's a series of circular boulevards, but the different gates survive as decorations in the traffic circle. And it's fun when you're traveling to be able to look into the past, when you look at the contemporary, the, today's transportation infrastructure, or even the map. Here you can see there would have been circular roads like this going out from the river, and in Europe, the river brought the economy into the town, just like trains brought the economy into the towns in our society. We have a concept on the wrong side of the track. You know, in Florence, this would be the right side of the track, and this would be the wrong side of the track, where the crusty uh, artisan community was, and where the immigrants, and where people who didn't fit the norm, didn't get the other side, the wrong side of the track. But in Europe, that's always the wrong side of the river. In Rome, you got Cascadere, in uh, Sevilla, you got Triana, and in Florence, you got Ultra Arno. And I'm sure when Lucy wanted to really have an adventure, she would go across that bridge into <laughs> Ultra Arno. That's where I go when I'm with my TV crew to have a real uh, predictable, great footage of crusty people and artists and activities and so on. Um, okay, so from the top of the door, and that dome, by the way, was the greatest dome Europe had built, Europe had built until that time. It sort of kicked off the architectural renaissance. To understand the importance of that dome, when Michelangelo was assigned to build the, design the dome of St. Peter's in Rome, he said, I can build a dome bigger, but not more beautiful than the dome in my hometown of Florence. This would have inspired a lot of those um, grand, uh, grand tour people like Lucy and George. And from the top of that dome, which means cathedral in Italian, you can see straight streets. And when you see straight streets, that's a good indication that it uh, has a uh, history going back to Roman times, because Florence started out as a Roman city with a rectangular Roman uh, um, military garrison kind of plan with the east and west and north and south entry, and two roads that came together in the middle. Those roads survive to this day, and it gives you a little sense of the history of the place. One, a couple of powerful scenes in the play or in the book are in Piazza della Signoria, and here we have the original place where David would have stood as the symbol of the city of Florence in front of the Medici Palace. And we've heard of the name Uffizi. That's uh, famous as the greatest collection of Italian paintings anywhere. It's my favorite painting gallery. But Uffizi in Italian means the opposite. So this was the opposite for the king of the city or the mayor of the city or whatever the Medici. And today, the Uffizi, the top floor, is filled with the greatest collection of Italian paintings. Uh, across from the square, you've got the loggia, and this is an important part of the novel also, and the loggia was designed originally as a place where leading uh, and educated people could come and talk about issues of the day. Uh, when they decided art is more important than free speech, they decided let's cut out the talking and let's put great statues there. <laughs> and uh, in, in Lucy's time, this was a gallery, an open-air gallery of great uh, statues, and, uh, and it's a beautiful place to hang out when you're in Florence. Stepping into the Uffizi Gallery, you will see that kind of art that people swoon to, to travel to Florence and then stand before that art swoon in the year 1908. In the year 2014, people still line up to get into that Uffizi Gallery. It's just one of the great attractions in all of Europe. And if I was to slip into my budget travel talk or my smart European travel talk right now, I'd remind you, anywhere in Europe you've got long lines, and there's really two IQs of European travelers. Those who wait in these lines and those who don't. There's always a way around the line. These people are not waiting to get into the UPC gallery. They're waiting to buy a ticket to get into the UPC gallery. And there's plenty of ways to get a ticket without waiting in that line. And then you march right up to the front 
and you go to the turnstile, you show your appointment, and they let you in, and you can come in front of all that great art without having to get sunburned first. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the art, the Ponte Vecchio, the traditional old kind of bridge that used to have shops on it to help pay for the construction and the maintenance of the bridge. And uh, to this day, there's shops along that bridge, and you can go across and check it out. Uh, in the novel, Lucy likes to get out and walk in the evening, have her own little uh, George uh, Edwardian adventure. And to this day, when you wander around the streets of Florence after dark, there's beautiful street conditions, like free concerts every couple hundred yards as you enjoy floodlit and moonlit Florence. Santa Croce is a big part of the uh, novel, and Santa Croce is the biggest Franciscan church anywhere. And uh, it's a medieval church, but this facade was put on only in the 1900s. Uh, this has been quite new when Lucy and George were there. And as part of her uh, routine on the, on the grand tour, Lucy would go into this church, and she has the chance here to stand before the tombs of Michelangelo, Galileo, Machiavelli, all these incredible people, and also to stand in front of the great art of Giotto, which is the first modern painter. Now there's a thing which is very interesting and I think related to a room of the view, it's called the Stendhal Syndrome. It's a French writer and he, Stendhal went down to Florence and he noticed that people were getting literally sick, overwhelmed by the beauty they just couldn't handle it. They would kind of go crazy and they had the Stendhal Syndrome. It's also called the Florence Syndrome. And it was only named in I think in the 1970s when there's about 100 cases a year when tourists would just go crazy. Now that seems a little far-fetched that a tourist would go to Florence, a Lucy or a George would go to Florence and be overwhelmed with the beauty and actually kind of go lose their sense of reality. As a tour guide, for 25 years I've been taking our tour groups through Florence. To this day we take our groups through Florence and I'm always remembering one time I had a woman who had stencil syndrome in Italy. And I'll, it's a fascinating story, I don't have time to talk about it tonight, but people can go crazy with the art in their Florence. And you have to be careful about that. Keep an eye on your partner, okay? <laughs> Keep an eye on your partner. But standing in front of Giotto in 1908, if you lived in this very sheltered existence that Lucy did, there's a good chance you would do things that your mother and father would be surprised that you would do. And uh, you can blame it on Stenzel. <laughs> so here's the view, and I don't know exactly where the view uh, uh, that inspired the, the novel is, but remember, they went up to Pietole, which is in the hills outside of Florence. And I was just talking to David about this, this earlier this evening. As a guidebook writer, you know, you just, oh yeah, you gotta go to Piazzole. And David and I both been at the Piazzole last night up there, and I just thought, what's the big deal? But it, <laughs> these days, it's just not, it's a little bit uh, disappointing. But 100 years ago, it really was something to get on a horse carriage, hire a, a horse-drawn taxi with your partner, and head on up to Piazzole and be overwhelmed by that beautiful view in that beautiful view. So I hope that gives you just a, a little context for uh, enjoying the play, and thank you very much for inviting me.